Hello and welcome to another episode of Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd. We are excited to have another great show in store for you. We'd love to hear from you, so if you have any gardening questions, simply dial 1-800-676-5446. Those phone volunteers will be glad to help you. If you'd rather send us an email or a few pictures along with your question, send those to byf.unl.edu. Be sure to tell us as much as you can about your question, including where you live. If you love to watch Backyard Farmer, you can also check out our YouTube channel after the show. Consider subscribing so you won't miss any of our good content. And you can always follow Backyard Farmer during the week on our Facebook page. So let's start with some samples, and this is a peach of a sample. It is a peach of a sample. I did bring a peach tonight, <laughs> and this is from our Growing Together Nebraska garden at the Extension Office in Madison County in Norfolk. And every now and then, when you're looking at your small green peaches, you'll see this little glob of ooze coming out. And I know this has got a big spot up here. That's just from it rubbing on a branch. But this ooze, if you pull it off, you'll see there's a brown spot right there. And that's where an oriental fruit moth mm. caterpillar has eaten into that fruit. Lots of our fruit boring caterpillars like to come in through the top by the stem or up through the blossom end, but these will go right through the side in the soft uh, peaches and they'll burrow through. So this is our first generation of oriental fruit moths that'll do this. Later on they'll do the more classic come in through the top and uh, bore into the pit and eat the seed. But at this point they're going through. Management's really easy. If you're talking about backyard, you know, small number of trees, just pick off the affected fruits and dispose of them. You don't have to do much more than that. I see maybe one or two a year on my trees at home. So it's pretty easy to take care of that way. All right, excellent. Thank you, Wayne. Okay, Terry. All right, so um, I have brought a bottle, a bottle of um, concentrated um, poison ivy and brush killer. We've been having lots and lots of questions about killing vines, um, especially poison ivy in the pe people's yards. So this is kind of what you're going to look for. It's probably going to have two or three different active ingredients. Um, it's going to depend on what brand you get as to what the active ingredients are. They're all going to work really well. Most likely um, you will be putting multiple applications on, but make sure you read the back of the label open it up, read all the instructions on what to wear, how to apply it, when to apply it, and all those kinds of good tidbits. All right, thanks, Terry. Okay, Amy, what's the rot tonight? The rot, so everybody's been busy collecting those wonderful yummy strawberries. And as you're in there pulling out the strawberries, you're seeing these rots and spots. So I brought two different leaf diseases. The first one we're gonna look at is this one here. Sorry, they're a little wilted, they didn't like the warm weather. This is what we call a strawberry leaf spot, really creative, right? Um, it's fairly showy, you'll see this on the upper leaves. It gives that dark purple border brown and as it gets older, those will break through and then it kind of gives you a ratter tattered look. Traditionally, historically, this was a major problem of strawberries, but now majority of our strawberries are actually resistant. And so this ends up being a cosmetic issue and nothing for you to worry about. The second one we have, we find on the lower side of the strawberry plant, and this is leaf blight. Um, this one is characterized by that, you see that beautiful V there. So the infection starts at the tip, and then it keeps working down and down to the base of the petiole, so you get that nice V, and it will continue to turn brown and yellow. This is another fungal leaf spot. Typically, it's not a major issue and ends up being a more cosmetic. If you are concerned about all of these, the best thing to do is fall cleanup. They overwinter in the debris, so clean up your strawberry beds really well at the fall, and you shouldn't have a problem with your strawberry beds and not having all the nasty rots and spots next year. All right, thanks, Amy. All right, Sarah, you get beauty. Yeah, it's, it's beautiful, but it's very prickly. <laughs> so this is a Canthus spinosa, uh, spinosus, and the common name for this is spiny bear's breeches. And this happens to be blooming in the Yider Garden here on East Campus right now. Um, this is a perennial that's hardy to zone five. It's not native in North America. It actually uh, comes, uh, uh, comes from Asia. Um, and it, it does, it's very striking. It's a very striking kind of structural 
or architectural looking plant in a landscape. It's got this very upright look to the, uh, the flowers when they're blooming. The leaves themselves, they're kind of large and I didn't bring one, but they're very shiny dark green and they are also quite spiny. So you have to be a little careful because these, these are sharp. These are really <laughs> sharp, um, but something unusual. You know, if you wanted to have something a little unusual in your garden, uh, uh, you might think about Acanthus uh, spinosus. All right, thank you, Sarah. Okay, Wayne, you get the first round of pictures. Uh, the first one comes to us from West Des Moines, Iowa. And uh, this is a hawthorn, and she found these little white growths that she'd never seen before. What is it and how to get rid of it? Well, this is hawthorn mealybug, and you're seeing the adults right now um, that are that covered in the white a waxy substance, so it's really difficult to topically treat them with anything because that wax protects them. You can target crawlers in early May, but they have a habit of hiding in crevices of bark and under bark, so they're really tough to catch that way, and also dormant oils tend not to work that well, either because eggs in the crawlers are up underneath bark where it's tough to get thorough coverage to get into them. So unfortunately, one of our best methods is moving into um, what we might call one of our more questionable tree insecticides. And imidacloprid does work fairly well for controlling it because that's a product that gets into the xylem, I believe, of that plant and it moves up and out with it. And then that insect is then exposed to it that way. All right, thank you, Wayne. Uh, your next one comes to us from Amherst, Nebraska. You have two pictures on this one. Uh, he calls them aliens on choke cherry and wild plum and wonders, is it insect or is it a rotten spot? Actually, neither. Mm -hmm. This is actually a mite mm -hmm. that has made these homes. This is choke cherry finger gall. And nothing you necessarily need to worry about. Most of our galling insects on leaves like this do not cause any permanent damage to the plant. They may be unsightly, but it's just their current home for this year. All right, thank you, Wayne. And you have one more, and this is our first one of these. This is uh, Northern Dixon County. Mini grasshoppers on his taters. How does he uh, get rid of the grasshoppers? Well, if it's in your garden, first thing you need to do is keep your grass shorter around your garden. Mow it properly to proper height. Don't let it get long at all. Uh, the grasshoppers aren't as interested in that taller grass. So that keeps them away. You also kill a few when you mow. So that's another perk. Uh, since they're small and they're still in the nymphal stage, most of our garden insecticides will work if you're talking about the permethrins or the carbarils in the various forms. All right, thank you, Wayne. Terry, speaking of poison ivy, <laughs> this one comes to us from Elkhorn. Uh, he's had three cases of the rash working in his fenced garden. He's been fighting it. He's been He's got patches all over the place. He, uh, he wants to make sure that this is what it is, and then he wants to have us tell him how to take care of it. And this last picture is actually what it can do. This is from Pioneers Park, and it's about as tall as we are. <clears throat> well, that doesn't mean it's very tall, but um, so yes, that is poison ivy. Um, <clears throat> it will kind of vine about, uh, it can be spread by birds too. Um, you're probably going to need like a three-way, so like that um, that brush killer that I brought is probably going to have like trichopleur or dicamba or 2,4-D or something like that that's going to be in it. I would probably make sure that you have at least two different active ingredients in it. You're going to have to cut it, paint it, and um, it's going to take multiple different up multiple applications to get rid of it. You're just gonna have to continue at it. It may take you a couple years. All right, thanks, Terry. And you have another one that is a difficult one to control. This is a papillion viewer, trumpet vine uh, across the fence that has invaded. She said she actually does cut. She uses sucker punch. She cut out 97 shoots <laughs> before she sent us the email. <laughs> <laughs> she she is very tenacious. Um, so actually, I would you're gonna do the same thing like you do for the um, poison ivy. You're gonna cut it and you're gonna use that that brush killer. So three way product most likely gonna be be in it, and then make sure that you um, continually do it. It's just it's gonna be it's gonna be continued. I think she said that the 
the parent plant is in somebody else's yard. So until they get rid of it, you most likely are gonna continue getting that. <laughs> Thanks. All right, Amy, uh, it's a great rots and spots time. <laughs> so uh, your first one comes to us from Wayne, Nebraska. It's hens and chicks with a fungus problem. And this comes to us from a six-year-old boy who loves backyard farmer. Wow, we appreciate you love and our show and hope you keep looking and taking pictures. And the picture you sent, this is really neat and interesting. Um, I actually had to blow it up a couple times and this is unusual. Um, this is actually just a slime mold that the spores got moved around by insects. There was enough water in there and it was able to start growing. It isn't going to hurt the hen and chicks at all. Um, if you don't like it, you could actually just go in and kind of pop it off and pull it out. But really very unique situation and it was a good eye to be catching that. Excellent. Uh, your next one is a Beatrice viewer has a peace lily in her house. She says these little mushrooms grow, die, then come back again, and she's wondering, does she need to repot and put in new soil? It just means you have fairies going around in your uh, <laughs> yeah. peace lily. It's their new home. Um, actually, there's nothing you really can or really need to do. What this is is just a fungal structure. The fruiting body is breaking down dead organic matter. <clears throat> Typically, when I start seeing a lot of mushroom growth in a houseplant, it's a little too wet. So maybe slow down the number of waterings that you're doing, make sure you're watering when the peace lily needs it and starts to droop a little bit. And that will help offset some of that mushroom growth. Excellent. Your next one comes to us from Wilbur. Uh, she found this fungus among us, her tomatoes and her basil plants in her garden in this, and it's a stra straw bale garden. So what should she do about this? So this is one of those, you don't need to do anything. It is breaking down that straw, which is dead organic matter and putting it into carbon sources. There's several different species. This is a really neat looking one. It kind of looks like a snake and then it kind of looks like ears depending on which way you want to look at it, but nothing harmful. All right, and your final one, um, this is from Bennett, found it in his yard, seemingly grew overnight. Is it toxic to pets and people? And I don't know how many of these we got this week, but it was a lot. It was a lot. This one is <laughs> gorgeous. I mean, look at the yellow of it and it's once again another one of those slime molds. Those slime molds will come in yellows and blues and purples and grays. Um, they grow very quickly. They're all superficial. If you don't like it you can hit it with a strong blast of water and it'll wash it right away. It's not toxic. Um, so if your pet would accidentally lick some of it it shouldn't hurt, hurt your pet. Um, they usually are very short-lived 24 to 48 hours and then they kind of melt and go away. All right thanks Amy. Sarah, uh, your first two pictures come to us from a viewer in Omaha who has uh, blueberries. They're in containers. He thinks this is a disease. Some of the leaves have turned brown and dead, but they are in containers, so, which is why you got it instead of Amy. Sure. So there are several uh, leaf diseases that blueberries can get. Um, and I think there, there could be two of them here. The larger brown spots could be an anthracnose, and then the smaller spots, uh, a septoria. So um, again, blueberries have multiple leaf fungi. Uh, if you wanna prevent that in future years, you need to start spraying them with a fungicide, like a, a Mancozeb type product um, at the green tip stage. That's when the buds are just opening and then you continue on through the season until you're done harvesting. All right, uh, your next one comes to us actually from New Mexico. She uh, is growing horseradish in a container and they've had horrific temperatures and she's kept it moist, but it's done this. What do we think here? Yeah, I really think that this is probably just heat damage. Um, even, even if there is moisture in the soil, sometimes if it's tremendously hot, um, the leaves just can't pull the water up well enough and you'll, you'll get browning and leaf death like this. So what I would do is just clear away all those brown leaves and um, if there's some place where you could pull it into maybe a little bit of shade, you know, typically horseradish is a full sun plant, but you know, considering we're just at the beginning of the summer and you're probably gonna continue to get very, very high temperatures for a couple of months at least, maybe a little bit of shade, especially in the afternoon might help it do better. All right, and your final two pictures come to us from Oak Creek, Wisconsin. He's wondering about the browning in the arborvita here and what can be done about it. So that kind of damage in arborvita is very common. And when we see it early in the spring, quite often it's a winter desiccation type of injury. But, but you know, anything that killed the branches could, would cause this type of brown foliage. So you really need to get in there, look closely at the branches that are dead, see if there's any bark damage, if there's been any, 
you know, voles or anything chewing on the, those stems. Also, just another thing to keep in mind, uh, you know, a rock mulch landscape is not a great location for arborvitae because it will reflect a lot of heat, uh, which they don't particularly like. And they do better if they have some afternoon shade. So just a couple things to keep in mind. All right. Thank you, Sarah. Well, we have had some spirited discussions about identifying certain plants, especially some of those poison ones that look a lot like some of the harmless plants in our landscapes. For our first feature tonight, Terry and I show you a few of the vining examples. We've had lots of questions this year about IDing plants and especially vines, and I've been getting them a lot more since I've been sitting in the Hort chair having to answer these questions. So today, Kim and I decided that we would come out and show you kind of what some of these are and how to ID them and possibly how to control them in your own backyard. And this is especially true because we had a kind of a fun back and forth banter when we were in Norfolk about whether it was Boston Ivy or poison ivy. So here we are standing in a park where we have Virginia creeper, we have woodbine, we have Boston Ivy, we have wild grape, we have euonymus, and we have poison ivy. And even wild strawberry, which was a question from last week. Exactly. So these viney things are either positive and great to have in your yard or climbing if you don't really care about whether they're climbing and if they're not going to do damage, or they can really be vicious. So Terry, let's talk about the Virginia creeper and the woodbine. So, <laughs> so the, these are great. Um, people ask us a lot of times for ground covers. These can potentially be a nice ground cover. However, if you do have some place for them to start crawling up, they will crawl up and almost overtake or overtake some trees. They turn a beautiful red and they're, you know, native. They twine, they twirl, but you can see what they do when they crawl around the ground. And we have a couple examples here of what happens when you mow them because they just get shorter and they just hang right on. So they're gonna go like this across the landscape. So let's talk about the euonymus since that's one you've got in your hand or winter creeper. So this is one that we get a lot of times questions about what is this insect on this plant? It does get scale <laughs> quite frequently so this is one that sometimes people don't maybe want to put in there, but it does creep along the ground, but it also will start crawling. All the way up a tree again. So let's talk then about Boston Ivy versus Poison Ivy. And our debate on air <laughs> was leaves of three, let it be, which is classic Poison Ivy. But Boston Ivy, when it's young, has leaves that are not divided. So same thing, this is gonna crawl, this is gonna climb, and if it's intertwined with poison ivy, then you've really got a problem. And we have just wads and wads of poison ivy. If you mow the poison ivy, it grows very aggressively on the ground again, then goes up the trees. Poison oak, poison sumac, all of those are really difficult to control. Control being? So control being most likely it's gonna end up being a chemical control. It will be one of those brush killers where you're gonna have to cut it down and then paint it and it's gonna be multiple different applications throughout probably a couple, three years depending on how invasive it is in your area. And finally, we're gonna end with the poison hemlock, which is not a vine, but it is all over. We've been getting so many questions about it. We've talked about it a great deal on air. And again, this is a don't touch, bag it, tag it, throw it in the trash, and be careful about getting that in your landscape. So do be careful out there when you're enjoying that gardening and take some time to know the different characteristics of those bad ones. Get rid of them as soon as you can, carefully in your spacesuit. <laughs> All right, uh, Wayne, you have two pictures of this one. 
And this is a, an insect she has not seen before. It's in the garden under her radishes. Can you identify it and let them know if it's beneficial or a bad guy? And it's nice of her to put the penny in there. Yes, nice use <clears throat> of scale. Mm -hmm. uh, this is one of those that uh, most people don't see because most people don't go digging around a, um, a dead animal carcass that's to the point of decomp that everything is dry. These are hide beetles, <laughs> hide as in tanned hide, mm -hmm. and that they f feed on feathers, dried skin, fur. They're one of the last insects that comes through in the decomposition co process. So they're some of our recyclers. I'm not sure why it was in the radish patch. Not, Something dead under there. <laughs> a I'm feather. Not, I'm not we'll, going anywhere. We'll hope I, it's a feather. I don't, I don't need any uh, <laughs> talks about needing to sleep with the fishes because we came up with something that shouldn't be found. <laughs> All right. Your next picture comes to us from Omaha. Uh, saw this insect on the bubbler rock, and he thinks it looks like an earwig, but the abdomen is a little different. He's correct. It is not an earwig. Mm -hmm. This is a rove beetle. And the elytra on these are really short, so they're, they're kind of tucked up towards the front side, or the just over barely the back of the abdomen, and then the hind wings are tucked up underneath that. So a little bit different than the other beetles we're used to seeing, but they're predaceous. Mm -hmm. So they're one of the good guys. All right, and then you have a picture next that is a, a geranium. And the question is, what are these, and will they turn into something beautiful? Yes and no. <laughs> uh, this is an interesting one because I've never seen white line sphinx moth caterpillars on geraniums. Mm. And it, it's a little different. Normally they're on our weedy plants. My, I had a couple kids feeding and raising these that we got from Curly Dock. Mm -hmm. So they usually eat a lot of our weedy plants. I would just pick it off. Um, it's unusual to see that on there. Thanks so for sharing. So it's not a tobacco budworm yet? No. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. They're in not that yet. backyard farmer garden. Oh, good. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Terry, your first question uh, comes to us from Omaha. She has this weed coming up all over in the perennial garden bed. She's been trying to pull it by hand. She did send a follow-up and say, yes, it has not flowered yet, and it's still all over everything. So this is, I believe, wild strawberry. Um, one of the things that you can do to figure out if it is or isn't, um, it will bloom five petals white. If it's mock strawberry, it will bloom five petals yellow. Um, mock strawberry will have probably a little bit smaller leaf, but it's gonna be in the same shape. So what, let it bloom and see what it is. All right, and kill it how? Um, <clears throat> I would kill it in the fall with um, a broadleaf weed killer if you want to get rid of it. All right. Uh, your next one comes to us from Elkhorn. Uh, she says, is this a weed? It's about two to three feet tall, three clumps of them in a flower garden. Yep. So Rock had this last week. This is Virginia stickweed. It will have kind of a white to pale blue flower, and then it'll get this round fruit on it that's going to have like these little hooks like Velcro. So it is a weed, um, dig it, pull it, uh, whatever you need to do to get rid of it. Before all of those end up in your socks. Yes. All right, and your final one is, uh, this came up in the mulch in the edges of the lawn. Um, so if it gets mowed, it just keeps growing, but stays short in some places where we missed weeding it, it was five feet tall. <laughs> Yep, so this this is lamb's quarters. It's related to amaranth, so some of those pretty flowers that we've had in the backyard farmer over the years, it's related to that. Um, <clears throat> it will get kind of these kind of ugly white flowers on them. You don't want them. Um, these are really easy to dig out or pull out. You can also use a broadleaf weed killer um, if the temperatures are low enough to apply it. All right, thank you, Terry. Amy, two pictures on this first one. Um, this is a daylily issue. It is uh, west side of the house in full sun in the afternoon. Black, dark brown spots on the buds and then some things going on on the foliage. So taking a closer look at the picture, I did spend some time looking at it, making sure we weren't looking at daylily rust. We are getting into that time frame. But as you look at the brown spots on those buds, it's not quite right. If it was rust, it should be raised. It should be pustuly um, and rough appearance. And this looks fairly smooth in appearance. So I'm leaning toward this might be environmental. 
with it being on that west side and full sun, it might just be a little too much heat. Um, and so we're getting those spots that are occurring, so. All right, uh, two pictures on this next one. This is a Fort Calhoun viewer. What is causing this brown creeping up from the bottom of the asters and how to control it? It looks pretty severe. So this picture, if you really take a close look, you see all these little black dots on there. Um, this is actually city mold. And city mold is all those fungi that are usually breaking down dead organic matter. But in this situation, the city mold is actually feeding on insect excrement, poo, whichever way you would like to talk about it because it has lots of sugary bases. So with it being an insect, I'm gonna throw it over to Wayne <laughs> on potential insect pests that are affecting these asters. Yep, just like uh, uh, the term we use as entomologists is honeydew. Honeydew. <laughs> honeydew uh, for, for that uh, excrement. And it's just the extra fluid and sugar that is really a lot of that in the plant sap. And so the insect filters out the more things like amino acids that are a lot more scarce. Could be aphids, it could also be lace bugs. Uh, we had uh, some masters at our office up in Norfolk that looked just like that and worse come July mm -hmm. uh, last year. And it, so you need to use a topical or maybe choose a different plant in that place. All right, thank you. And Amy, you have one more. This okay. is a West Point viewer and it's a strange thing on the cucumber plant. That's uh, a strange thing. <laughs> it is a strange thing. I will have to say, this week I've had to scratch my head a little bit. So as you can see, it's girdling that stem of that cucumber. The best guess I have right now, and it's really a guess because we need to look at it a little bit closer, is there's a disease called gummy stem. And it's a fungal disease that can infect the leaves or the stems itself. And this fungus will colonize and then it forces that stem to girdle. And so then all of a sudden, because of that girdling, it will collapse down because it can't move the water and nutrients through it. Um, fairly common in large industrial uh, farming operations with cucurbits. So most likely you want to take a look at it. If those vines don't seem to be recovering, this might be, I would really highly suggest, this might be a cucumber you want to remove um, so it's not spreading to other cucumbers in your garden. All right, thanks, Amy. Uh, Sarah, you have uh, from Omaha, this, uh, two pictures on this one. This is a viewer that has had this aspen for several years. This year, only one side of the tree has uh, leafed out and uh, he's wondering if you should wait to see if it's dead or cut it out or what do you think here? Um, if, that, if those branches were still alive, they would have leafed out by now. So I'm pretty confident here, you know, it lent late part of June saying those branches are dead. Um, and unfortunately, aspens are susceptible to um, some fungal kinkers, which infect the bark, which can cause branch death like this. Um, so that's a potential cause. All right. And then you have three pictures on this next one. This is a Douglas County viewer, 18-year-old uh, cottonwood, uh, neighbor three houses to the north has the same issue, same tree, same age. Mm -hmm. So cottonwoods are also susceptible to um, some fungal kinkers that can kill the bark. So it would be really helpful in pictures like these to have a distance picture, but then also have a picture at the base of the dead branch where it attaches to the trunk so that we could look to see if there were uh, discoloration in the bark or cracking or anything like that that would give us um, a really good clue that this is a canker. But that's most likely what, what is going on with both of these trees. Cankers do not respond to fungicide applications, so there really is no control for these types of things. Um, so unfortunately, you're just left with pruning out the dead branches and then deciding if there's enough left of the tree for you to work with. All right, thank you, Sarah. Well, our garden is full of All America selections, and this week we take time to examine one that is really beautiful, thrives either in your ornamental beds or in a container. Here's Terry to show us what this is in the Backyard Farmer Garden. This week in the Backyard Farmer Garden, we're going to continue looking at the All America Selection winners. Remember last week on the show, we started with the Bauer lettuce. We looked at that. This week, we're going to look at a new celosia called Flama Orange. This is one of those upright plume celosias that are really fun and exciting. They look fantastic in your uh, raised beds or in your ground beds or in containers. They won't fade, which is a great bonus for these. Um, they will take full sun, 
they will not really rebloom too much, but they will bloom continually from spring to frost. They're going to be that solid pop of orange that you really want to see. They only get to be about 9 to 11 inches, so you're going to want to keep them kind of more to the front of the container or the bed, but they will give you that pop of color. So stop by the Backyard Farmer Garden and check out Flama Orange Celosia. Right now, it is time for the lightning round. All right, Sarah, you're in the hot seat. All right. Ready. This is a broken bow viewer who said, uh, unfortunately, her uh, asparagus got weed whacked to about six inches tall. Should she replant or will it recover next year? If it's been in the garden for several years, just let it regrow. It'll send up new shoots, and I think it probably should recover pretty well. All right. This is a carny viewer who says his zucchini is not blooming. Um... So not being in full sun is one of the main causes of not blooming well. Too much nitrogen fertilizer, um, those would be the first things I'd think about. All right. This is a Gretna viewer who has 20-year-old ewes and wants to prune 10 to 12 inches off of them right now. Is that okay? So midsummer would not be the ideal time to prune a ewe. Either, you, you know, either, either pruning it late in the fall or earlier in the spring would be better. Um, it, you won't kill it, but it's not the ideal time. All right, uh, this is an Omaha viewer who has a six-year-old purple gauge plum that is fruiting, but her Ruth Gustetter plum is not. What's the deal? So, you know, things that would cause fruit trees not to bloom, you know, the, f the flowers got frozen by some kind of a late spring freeze would be one of the main culprits. Um, pr pruning at the wrong time when you're actually pruning off the flowers, although it's, it's really hard to believe you'd prune off 100% of the flowers would be another one. Um, but spring freezes are one of the biggest culprits. All right, thank you, Sarah. Okay, Amy, ready? Yep. All right, your first question comes to us from somebody up in the Ponca area. Okay. They're wondering about Baroque blight this year. Have we seen it or is it uh, kind of quiet? Currently it's fairly quiet. Um, I'm suspecting we should start seeing it here soon. All right, this is uh, an Omaha viewer who says that some of her service berry leaves and then the little fruits are turning a little bit yellow now and they do that every single year, just the ends, the tips. Why would that be? So service berry can get a lot of those cedar fill in the blank rust and most likely that's what you're seeing. They will attack those capsule ends of the berries. All right, uh, we have curling tomato tops and tomatoes dying. Carney, Grand Island, Link, pick your spot. Pick your spot. <laughs> the question is, has there been any growth regulator herbicide sprayed within several miles of your residence? And with the warm temperatures, if those, those herbicides were sprayed within two days and it goes up to 80, 90 degrees, that herbicide is still going to move. All right. Uh, this is an Albion viewer who wants to know, is there any way to tell whether your potatoes have that rotten center before you dig them up? No, you don't. It's a pleasant surprise. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's a pat of black butter. <laughs> okay, Terry, are you ready? Yes. All right, your first question comes to us from Plattsmouth. Uh, this viewer wants to know how to kill Creeping Charlie that is in her Vinca Minor and in her Money Wart bed. Uh, the only way you're going to be able to do that is hand pull. All right. This is a viewer who says she has raspberries and strawberries that are spreading into her turf. How does she control them in the turf? Um, you're gonna have to cut along where they're spreading in and dig them out. Um, you're gonna, they're gonna sucker and you're gonna cut that daughter plant off the mother plant. Right. And share it with your friends. <laughs> All right, uh, this viewer from Beatrice what is replanting their hail damaged vegetable garden. They want to know should they put down preen as a part of that process? Um, if you are replanting with plants, then you can get away with that. If you are replanting with seeds, no. All right, uh, a Wood River viewer wants to know whether buffalo grass will outcompete an existing fescue lawn. <sighs> Uh, maybe? <laughs> Probably. Sarah's, Sarah's saying, no, 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 no. <laughs> I don't know. No. <laughs> it won't. It will not. <laughs> all right. A little help, which is what we're all about. Okay, Wayne, you ready? Let's go. Okay, uh, this one came in actually today. This is a Ceresco viewer who said there are 
flies biting and they're sucking blood and they remind him of like the cow horn flies. What are they and how do you control them? If they're that size, they probably are some of the larger biting flies. There's ones that look just like house flies that are biting. That's yeah. probably what they are. All right, control. Control. Perfect. <laughs> All right, um, this is a Lincoln viewer who wants to know, do you scout on the upper or the lower leaf surface for squash vine borer eggs? Squash vine borer, you look right at the leaf axles along the vine. All right, uh, we have a papillion viewer who wants to know whether earwigs or something similar to that insect bite. Earwigs attempt to bite, but they don't have enough jaw strength to do much damage to you, so. Nothing to be worried about. All right, this is a Pawnee City viewer who has sweet corn and wonders whether it is too late to treat for corn earworm. Corn earworm is a continuous flight. Uh, we get mixed uh, as we get later into the year, so you can protect it as you go through the summer. All right, and a South Bend viewer wonders whether there is a treatment for sand fleas. Sand fleas. <laughs> Sounds like something out of Star Wars. Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> I, I, would be more curious to know what they're really after, because... All right, maybe a picture of... A picture, better description than just sand fleas, because there's a lot of things that bounce around on sand, but okay. I'm not sure what they're after. All right, Sarah, what are our plants of the week this, this week? <clears throat> so we've got uh, three really pretty ornamental shrubs here that, you know, potentially could be add, add, added to a garden. So the top one here with these uh, little globular white flowers, this is called button bush. And this is a native, this is a North American native shrub. Um, it gets to be on the large side, so you know, five to eight feet tall. Um, it blooms obviously midsummer, uh, and it will, it tolerates wet areas. So you could plant this in like say the edge of a, um, a water garden or pond or something like that, and it would do very well there. Full to partial sun is where it thrives. And it's a great pollinator plant. Butterflies and bees and all sorts of things like, like that love these flowers. So that's button bush. Then we have, down here in the front, we have this pretty purple flower. This is lead plant, and lead plant is also another North American native. Um, it's got this uh, pretty uh, grayish foliage. It's covered with lots and lots of little hairs, which give it this grayish look. And then we've got these stalks of purple flowers. So um, if, you're, you know, if you're wanting to plant natives in your landscape, um, that would also be great for pollinators. Lead plant might be a good one to try. It does really well in hot sun and uh, fairly dry locations. So a pretty tough plant to uh, a, pl a pretty tough plant that's fairly easy to grow. Then last but not least, we've got this um, little flower here in the front with the yellow flowers. This is bush honeysuckle. This is not a native, but um, it's a nice uh, kind of short, shrubby type of honeysuckle. And these are going to be, as you see, just beautiful little yellow flowers. Um, so that would be another one that would do well, kind of in the medium to front of a uh, garden uh, with this shorter bush honeysuckle. Excellent, thanks, Sarah. All right, Wayne, uh, two pictures from the first viewer and two pictures from the second viewer from different locations of the same beastie. The first two come to us from Missouri Valley, Iowa. What are these and how do you get rid of them? Uh, there are thousands and they swarm like flies. And then, um, so there's a closer up, and then your third and fourth picture here are from a viewer who was in northeastern Iowa at a park, and they've seen hundreds of thousands, and then they found what looks like an inchworm, and they wondered if the inchworm and this particular butterfly are related. Okay, to sum everything up here, it's hackberry emperor, or the butterflies, and they are prone to you can call them outbreaks where you see a lot of adults come out in flushes like this. Uh, not something you need to be too worried about. They will disperse and move on and not be around too much longer. So bear with them. They're butterflies, they're pollinators. Uh, this particular caterpillar uh, had to work really hard to figure out what was going on here. I can narrow it down to two possible groups. Mm -hmm. It's got the head end that would be characteristic of either a skipper butterfly or a prominent moth. Both of them have that head that, for lack of a better term, kind of looks like a butt. <laughs> and yeah, I could say something else, but the producer will yell at me. <laughs> so they're not the hackberry moth. No, it's, they're, they're not. The they're not the hackberry butterfly. There's something else. Um, not really sure, and with it being black like that, the other, th if 
they were all black like that, it would help to know that, but it okay. could be sick with the disease. All right, uh, you have one picture of this next one. Simply wants to know what this moth is. This is from Unadilla. Either a tobacco or tomato hornworm. It's tough to tell when you can't see the yellow spots on the side of the abdomen. All right, and uh, one other one. And this is, what's this beauty? And uh, what does it turn into? This is a yellow woolly bear, and I know it's white but they, early on when they're small, they're white, and then they go to yellow, and they can even turn a little light brown later. All right. Terry, you have uh, three pictures for this first one. Uh, there's, and this is from Kennard, or Kennard. Lawn receded three years ago with tall fescue, and then saw a few patches of this grass. Do they have to kill the whole lawn and start over? So I'm gonna thank Rock for helping with this because there's absolutely no way I would have been able to figure this one out on my own. And this is in honor of the College World Series. This is foul blue grass. <laughs> so um, it is a not prevalent perennial. It, it is a native to the US just like the bluegrass, but um, it will grow pretty quickly in the spring. And then once it gets hot, it should kind of go away. Really the best thing to do is just to make sure that you overseed with your preferred turf and um, fertilize and do all those good things and it should just snuff it out if you have a nice stand of turf. All right, uh, your next picture is an Omaha viewer who put down fescue sod in the backyard and then something rolled it up. <laughs> <laughs> Dennis isn't on, so what do we do? So it was probably either an opossum or a raccoon. Uh, looking for either grubs or worms or something like that. Um, the best thing to do is to make sure that you roll it down and get it good in contact, um, water it, make sure that you're watering it. It looked pretty dry, so if you maybe could keep watering it, um, Wayne would tell you more whether or not the grubs will stay there or not. But um, yeah, that's the best thing you can do. And your next one is a viewer with a maple tree with no turf, and what do we tell her? So I tell you that this is a great landscape opportunity because turf does not like to grow underneath trees. So I would mulch it and I would put beautiful um, shade loving plants underneath there. Perfect. All right, Amy, you have three pictures from this first viewer mm -hmm. and you had two or three others that sent in something similar. Tomato leaves are turning yellow, beginning on the bottom branches. Um, what do we have going on here? So if you look at the margins here, we are at the beginning of the season for early blight. Mm -hmm. Wonderful soil born fungi starts at the bottom with any rain splash and going to continue moving up and then causes the leaves to turn yellow and die prematurely. Now, if you do look at this picture, if the picture on the left doesn't look like it has as much brown spots, there are some. Um, the one thing you do need to be watching for would be nitrogen deficiency also. If you're not seeing the brown spots, I would lean towards some nitrogen deficiency also. All right, and you have two pictures from an Elkhorn viewer that uh, it's raised garden bed, it's new soil, they just, they croak. <laughs> You've done everything correct. And on the first picture, when you saw um, the whole plant, you would need to zoom in a little bit. But if you look at the terminal tips, everything is curled up. It's traditional growth regulator herbicide damage. Um, it looks like it's fairly severe drift and it doesn't look like the tomatoes are gonna grow out of it. All right, thank you, Amy. Sarah, your first two are uh, from Hardington. The rosebuds are not opening on these shrubs. Any ideas on this? So a couple of things could cause rosebuds not to open. The first would be thrips, which are a really tiny little insect that love to get down right into the tight growing center of the flowers and their feeding can cause the, the flowers to either become brown or, or just not open. And you, if, you were to, if you were to pick a flower and pull it apart, you might look for little streaks, irregular spots or streaks in the leaves that could indicate thrip feeding. Or if you have a microscope or a hand lens, you might actually be able to see the tiny little kind of yellowish uh, uh, cigar shaped uh, insects. The other potential problem it could cause roses not to open would be botrit um, botrytis gray mold. Um, and so, but that would appear, you would see, I would think you would see more of the kind of fuzzy gray growth on the flower buds. Um, so those are two possibilities. All right. Uh, two pictures on this next one. This is Sun Patience. It's on the west side of the house in full sun in the afternoon. Is this a disease or is this sun patients not liking that much sun? So, you know, this picture looks to me like physical damage. It almost looks like hail injury. And so I'm wondering if you had some hail um, in your landscape that could have caused this. Um, 
if it's extremely, it really, really intense sunlight, maybe, but I, I'm thinking more some kind of physical injury. All right, and two pictures on this one. This is an ivory halo of dogwood that went in this spring, uh, looked great, and then started to turn brown. What do we have going on? So there are some leaf spot diseases that affect uh, the dogwoods, and we see them almost every year. And so it looks like you might have the beginnings of some of that here. But this particular dogwood, since it's variegated foliage, also prefers to have some afternoon shade. And so I think you're getting a little bit of leaf burning just because it's in too much sun. So you might think about trying to relocate it to a, a portion of your landscape where it's going to get a little afternoon shade. All right. Thank you so much, Sarah. Well, in the western part of our state, the climate and the weather patterns can be quite different, and sometimes the storms we have here in the eastern part aren't quite as harsh. Chrissy Land from the Nebraska Forest Service is going to show us some evergreens that have been hit hard, might not recover. We are starting to see some damage show up on our evergreens uh, from a variety of different causes. Um, we've got some hail damage, we've got some drought issues, we've got some winter burn that's going on. Um, we're gonna go ahead and take a look at that today. Here we have some spruce trees that were damaged in 2019 with a large hailstorm. There were actually two storms that came through within 12 hours of each other and had softball sized hail. Uh, the hail fell in from the northwest, which makes it very unique that we see the death pattern on the north side of the tree. Um, we know that it's hail by looking at the top sides of the branches and seeing a lot of small wounds scattered all the way throughout the tree. And by looking at the death pattern, it's sort of all over the tree. It's not just one spot, um, it's sort of patchy. And so we can look at those wounds and unfortunately what happens is that with that many wounds, the tree can't keep up with um, fighting back on keeping the pests and diseases out. And so with so many open wounds, the tree is likely to be infected by pests and diseases such as canker. And as those trees get further stressed, we can see secondary problems come in like some bark beetle, which we have here on these trees. So the last problem that we had was hail. And this problem could possibly be hail, but there's other things that we want to look for. We can see that this tree has a pattern of thinning to it. Obviously, we're missing some needles on the ends of our branches. There are a few buds that are trying to push and there's some greener needles on the inside. I always encourage somebody to take a branch and go like this. And if a bunch of needles fall off, that's a sign that the tree is on its way out. Um, ways that we can identify if our trees are in the process of dying is again, looking at those needles and seeing, do we have glossy needles like what this tree to my left does? And it's very bright. We've got some very vibrant buds on the end of it uh, versus this tree where we have some dull needles that don't have that waxy cuticle on the outside. Trees, uh, particularly evergreens, if we think of Christmas trees, they can be green for a long time after they've been cut off from their root system. And so we know that our evergreens don't look dead necessarily when the damage actually happens. It's common for us to see a stand of trees that seem to be fine with just one or two that are randomly uh, within the bunch that are dead. And we might ask, why is it just one or two trees? That one individual tree might have something wrong with the root system on it, or maybe there is some sort of animal chewing on the root system. There's something that is site specific to that one tree. We're here at the Riverview Golf Course west of Scotts Bluff, and we're here on the edge of the rough, uh, where our trees are probably not getting quite as much moisture. And what we tend to see happen with our drought is that our trees are dying up at the very, very top. And we see just a few branches, some browning, maybe the top 12 to 18 inches. And likely what's happening is that while that soil is not ideal for growth, that tree is shrinking its root system to conserve energy. So even when we do get moisture, the tree doesn't have the ability to take up any of that moisture because it has such a reduced root system. So we'll see that death the furthest away from the roots up there at the top of our trees. The key to 
understanding your evergreens is going out and looking at your site, look around your tree, try and identify what could possibly be impacting your tree. Work with a professional arborist to identify what your problem is so that way you can get an idea of what options you have to work with your evergreens. And in what she said, go out and look, take a peek and take care of it. We have a couple of announcements tonight of way fun things in the gardening world as we always do. And I believe our very first one is the Omaha Rose Society Rose Walk, Sunday, June 26th, 1 to 4.30. Uh, you can follow that on the Facebook page for more info. Second one is Way Cool, which is coming up next at eight o'clock, Title IX, 50 years in the making. You can stream that at npm.org. And uh, it's just a fabulous thing for us to think about. All right, bang, bang, lightning round on pictures. So Wayne, the first one comes to us from Syracuse. What comes out of holes like this in the flower garden? Wolf spiders. Oh, yuck. Okay, uh, <laughs> your second two <laughs> are uh, from Omaha and thought we might like this. What are these guys? These are cicadas. Those are the exoskeletons from the final nymph stage and the adults are coming out, which was in that uh, other picture that was flashed up there briefly. Perfect. McCook, Nebraska, wondering what this one is out on a walk in McCook. I believe this one is a tortoise beetle pupa. Fun. All right. All right, Terry, uh, this is a Pawnee City viewer. What kind of a weed is this and how do we control it? And he thinks it's hemlock. Uh, no, these are Spanish needles. Um, they are uh, related to biddens. Uh, the only th good thing is the flowers are nice pollinators. They're going to get these funky seed heads that will attach to you if you're five feet away from it. <laughs> All right. This is a papillion viewer who said this uh, wild garlic looking thing uh, started two years ago. He doesn't let them flower. He's dug them out. Is there anything to... Uh, get rid of them permanently. Uh, continue doing what you're doing. Uh, you can also use a broadleaf weed killer if you cut it and then spray it. All right, and your final one here is uh, this weed keeps appearing in the lawn, especially along the edges of the lawn. What is it and how do we get rid of this one? Uh, this is not weed. Not weed likes um, compacted soils. So if you can aerate that area a little bit, um, it's easy just to go in with your soil knife and remove it off the edges. All right, uh, nice job. Amy, you have uh, two pictures on this first one. He thinks these are Norway spruce in Blair. They've uh, put on all sorts of cones and the top appears to be thinning. They do believe the top of one is being strangled by a canker. Is this true and is there anything he can do? Sorry to give you the bad news, your tree is dying. <laughs> um, it is a canker and there's nothing you can do for it at this point in time. All right, uh, you have two pictures on this one also. This is also Norway spruce. This is a Pleasantdale viewer. Wants to know what in the world is this twisty, gnarly growth? So this one was a little unique. Um, I'm gonna lean toward environmental and drought conditions. Um, I think the plant is trying to react to that drought, trying to conserve some energy, and so we're getting that twisting. So hoping for good rain, and even that segment before talks a little bit more how those roots change in that tree. And we're right. in drought conditions. All right, thank you, Amy. You have three, uh, Sarah, three pictures here. This is a Clark's Nebraska viewer. They really wanna save this maple tree. Um, they, uh, they say it's producing little tiny leaves and it turns uh, way bad fall color way earlier than fall. So when you have an overall effect like that in a tree where the, the leaves are turning color too early in the season, I mean, that, that's telling you that's something that's affecting the whole tree. And looking at this picture right here, this tree's got root problems. I mean, we can see some, some roots there on the surface of the soil that are starting to kind of circle the trunk. There's probably a lot more going on underneath the soil that we can't see. So um, just from these pictures, that's, that's my thoughts. And unfortunately, there's not going to be a whole lot you can do with that um, to, to save it or make it better, other than just good basic care. You know, mulch, get rid of the grass, mulch, water when it's dry. And if the tree has the chance, it might be able to pick up a little bit of vigor. But that's about all you can do. And plant it.